So I think we are now uh, recording. So um, get started. Okay. Uh, so folks, um, I'm really happy to see the teams engaging. Um, I heard a lot of good dialogue there. Uh, and uh, it's great to see you starting to really plan some of the texture, the detail elements of your projects. Um, overjoyed to see that. Now, uh, I've been notified a little bit about the um, uh, some of the project team members, uh, the, the roles that uh, different team members are playing uh, for each of the projects. Uh, and that's also a good step forward. Uh, I understood that um, team two, if I'm not mistaken, it, uh, has has selected the uh, plate waste app. Um, team one was leaning towards the at risk youth you, app. Yeah. Um, and can anyone confirm is is that yet settled or is that still a matter of some discussion? Okay, awesome. Uh, I I know the plate waste team. Um, had already contacted the stakeholders involved um, and I uh, can't overstate the importance of, of making sure you contact the stakeholders early and that you contact them often through the semester. They're a key asset, they can cut through a lot of speculation on your part and you know get to the heart of, of a lot of what's needed when it comes to different features. Um, uh, there's a lot of great ideas we have as technologists that when you engage with stakeholders, um, you come to see it in, in, in with other light or other needs, um, or uh, or you help uh, educate them. And one of the things you're going to discover with real world stakeholders is that there is uh, a far from it being the case like you're the really knowledgeable one about the technology and you're going to guide them through the software development that will realize their dreams. Um, far from being just a matter of that, far from being just a matter of you sit and they tell you exactly what you want and you go and you implement it and they're happy and you get a good mark. Um, it's, it's much more of a kind of dialectic, much more of a discussion back and forth with a heck of a lot of learning on both sides. You're going to be learning about what their needs are and about the language used, the sort of concept used in their domain. This may sound like minor matter, but um, it actually is not so much. I mean, just learning about like the uh, the structure of, of what it means to be at risk of a youth uh, in town. There's probably a lot of dimensions to that that most people in this room are not aware of. Um, and similarly, when it comes to you know dealing with childcare centers uh, and the researchers who deal with them and the needs as far as what in detail they're looking to to collect there's a huge amount you're going to need to come up to speed with there and you got to come up to speed with the language as well um it's not just the concepts it's how to describe them in a way that's fairly precise um and that's using terms that the stakeholders will understand and sometimes that means using terms that may mean something quite different in your context as a computer scientist or in sort of lay language, but they use in a different way. So there's often a lot of learning you've got to do from the stakeholders, but don't minimize the fact that the stakeholders have got to do a lot of learning from you as well. Um, because they may have some general ideas of what they want, but number one, they're going to have problems envisioning it. It's a little bit better for a project which has had a previous app built because they have some point of reference. You know, they, they have some concrete thinking about what it could look like, even if it really wasn't fully what they needed at the time. But beyond that, there's going to be, you know, a, a challenge in knowing in today's landscape, you know what it is they really want, how do they want to identify the kids, um, uh, how to handle the hustle and bustle of the, the child care center in terms of taking photos quickly that will capture the requisite information. And, you know, you're, you're going to be putting together some thoughts for them that may really make them think, what is it I really want? And that's 
typical. They don't, it's easy to think that you just go and you take down their requirements and you just go do it, but it's never like that. They often don't fully understand the implications of their requirement when it comes to technology until they're dialoguing with you. And they don't understand the trade offs between their requirements, right? Like if we did it this way versus that way, what's the implication? What's the implication of schedule? What's the implication and sort of usability and user interface, you know, complexity? Um, what's what's the trade-off in terms of the trickiness of implementing it? Uh, what's the trade-off in terms of the performance of the system? There's all these sort of things that emerge from their decisions that they don't understand. And you have to help them, you know, come to terms with that. So the best sort of stakeholder relationship is one that's very back and forth with respect to those things. Um, you know, it's not just them dictating, this is exactly what I want, because often you give it to them and they're not that happy with it. They, they really wanted something a little bit different. They just didn't think about it at the time until they see the real thing, they won't realize what they want. That's why it's important to give it, one of the reasons it's important to give it to them incrementally. And uh, conversely, you know, it can't be you you know, thinking of coming up with the greatest ideas of what's needed, uh, only to discover like nah, that isn't really what they that doesn't really meet their needs. So there's got to be humility back and forth on each side. There's got to be iteration. So this is the beginning of a of a good journey. And remember what I'm expecting from you. I do need you folks engaging with the stakeholders for every deliverable. For every uh, every deliverable, they should at least have a meeting with you once, um, and you know I'll be in touch with the stakeholders and make sure that's being done. Um, but more to the point, it's for your for your sake. You go a couple meetings without stakeholder meetings, a couple deliverables without stakeholder meetings. You'll be way off there and out of space, and then when you finally meet with them, it'll be like, what did that what I ordered? Uh, no, no. You know, we have to backtrack here, and, and that won't be very good. Uh, won't be good for us. So, anyway, really happy to see that. Work with your stakeholders. I want to remind you that a week from today, or a week from, you know, a, a week and one hour from today, you're going to be doing your ID zero presentation. That's in tutorial next week, 4 p.m. Uh, you're going to be presenting, uh, you're thinking about the technologies that's going into this. Now, you'll notice if, if you go through the syllabus, you'll notice that initial presentation doesn't have um, a, uh, a component of the mark associated with it. It's really, a, it's more preliminary and it's more for discussion. Okay, let me know what you're thinking. But you should have some idea by that in mind about what your technology stack might be, or at least what the major choices are that you're trying to decide. And you should have in mind something about you know the infrastructure you need. Um, so if you need you know something set up by the tech staff, you need a Tomcat server, unlike these days. Uh, uh, you need a uh, Postgres database, whatever. Um, uh, you know, there can be uh, some early action on it to make sure that's in place uh, soon. So I want you to think about it. It's important you not let that week go by without thinking in concrete terms, what do you really need to deliver on? And you should be thinking within your teams about how to educate yourself on that. Because even if there's a few people who understand those technologies well, even if there's a few people on your team who are experts in Node.js, or really, really understand some of the trade offs of Google Flutter. Um, you know, you're going to be needing to educate the rest of the team. You're going to be needing to very likely come up to speed with the testing technologies and mocking technologies and co coverage technologies and all those sort of good things um, that are also needed besides, you know, just the platform. Um, and often this is the time where people have tutorials. You also should be thinking, this is, this is key, 
about getting in place a requirements document soon. Now, you know, I'm not asking for a requirements document that's really, you know, just it goes to the full, all the nine yards for the sort of the look of it and, and, and all divided up into sections. I mean, that's great if you give it to me, but that's not required. The, the issue is you want to get down in writing the stakeholder expectations and the, the understanding between the two teams. So you want to get down something that captures the understanding coming out of many meetings with the stakeholder. So you can document it to your team. This course is not, and I repeat this, it's not about giving me what you think I want as far as kind of a description of what you've done so I can give you a gold star. It's about making sure your team is is really aware of the decisions that uh, have been had, aware of what they need to do, and what they need to coordinate on with others. And so if requirements change, you need to keep that document updated. It's not just for me to kind of look at it and say, yeah, you did a great job for, you know, ID1, and you check that off and it's gone for the rest of the term. You need to keep it live. And as the deliverables go by, it should evolve. And you should be adding things to it that reflect, you know, kind of the learning from, oh, that was missed, or, oh, this has been clarified, or, oh, this needs change. So you should be thinking about a requirements document, and you should be thinking about starting to think about what quality assurance would look like. You know, what would tests look like for this system? Um, what might be some end-to-end -end tests that could be run? If you start getting in mind the features of the system, you should be able to think about, oh, that'd be interesting. You know, we 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 add in a child care center, we add a couple kids, um, and we discover we made a mistake and we delete some horrible, delete it, you know, delete the record created for a child. Uh, and um, or you go modify it and you go add some containers. You should be able to think about some high-level test use cases that you could capture in a you know, and some test plans for end-to-end -end tests. So you should be creating these things. Um, and as we'll see today, as time allows, uh, peer reviews can be conducted on those sort of documents as early as possible. Testing, like testing itself is something that um, requires executable code, right? You've got to have executable code in place to test it. Um, now, with mocking, you can have test a portion of the app that depends on other pieces that are not yet implemented. That's no problem. You mock them out. You create fakes for them. We talked about that last time. So you can test portions of the app even if the surrounding infrastructure is created. But testing at some level requires executing code. Peer reviews. Whether they're inspections or informal peer desk checks, you know, pair test development, that doesn't require that sort of code. So you could start to review your requirements document. Eventually, a high level design document, um, if you're going to uh, create one about how the different pieces of the system work together, the admin site together with the app or what have you. Um, these are things you could start to review soon. Um, when you put them together, and those will count towards your requirements for inspections. So be thinking about this. The, the recurrent refrain, which I think I shared with you before, is that inspections turn out to be one of the real aha experiences of this, of this course for a lot of people, because they go through them late in the term and they say man we caught so many things i wish we had done that early this is your chance do it early sir so so get those things queued up it ain't too early to think about inspections just uh ask what you're going to inspect maybe it's the configuration for this as a configuration document um what have you or or plans for the technology set Get those things done. They're not too modest to do uh, inspections on, and it will get you further along the way if you're inspecting. Okay. Um, okay. Now, one other kind of administrative matter before we dive into like the material for today. So, the next hour at 4 p.m., Thorpe 205A, 
There's the tutorial. Tutorial is yours today. I'll be in my office if anyone wants to come by. You know, I, I know the, the two, uh, two project managers, I think uh, Shay for team one, who's Shay? Shay? Great. Um, and Jer Jeremy? Uh, awesome. So, um, you know, I admire your commitment to your teams by stepping up to that position. Um, I know there's many other people stepping up in lots of other ways, and that's awesome. Um, but just always be aware that if, you know, if you have uh, 4 p.m. Um, uh, commitment with your teams, the team should be aware I'll be in my office for office hours, um, just like I am on Thursday, the same time frame. Um, if the team wants to come by or a large part of the team to discuss or project managers, what have you, let me know. Okay. Um, and we'll try to get the TA also in touch with you so uh, she can help help uh, broker some thinking with respect to the class. Um, so the next hour, you can expand on those good discussions I saw taking place as I came in and set up. Okay. Okay. Um, so those are some major kind of announcements or meta level issues. Any questions I can answer right now? Questions about next steps or the course or challenges that you've encountered? Anything? Question? Um, yeah. So if, as you mentioned, like if you request some resources from the IT, yeah. um, we can get them. So what kind of resources can we expect? Well, um, IT going back many, many years, knows they're basically on call for 371 teams for hardware resources that are required. And I can enumerate examples, well, hardware and software, okay? You can ask them to set up um, configure servers for you. You can ask them to help provide you with certain departmental resources, like some years people have used specialized resources like the Oculus that lives up in and uh, 386 uh, in space there, there's, there's actually two Oculi, I don't know if you know, that the virtual reality systems, um, they're up there and for some 371 teams, they need those set up and configured and, you know, the team to be given access. And, and so the tech staff do that. Um, sometimes it is a database setup or server setup. Sometimes it's um, configuration of certain needs uh, for a, a service or something. So I don't know, like maybe you need help with uh, Jira or something like that. And they may maintain a, a Jira system in the department. In the past, it was track or it was, um, uh, they had a, another another system after track. In any case, um, you know, you can get those set up. Um, those aren't the only systems. And I'd say over the years, the dependence on those systems has lessened because there's so much in the cloud, right? You can use GitHub issues these days for issue tracking. You don't need to depend on Jira or Redmine or, or Bugzilla or whatever for issue tracking. Um, uh, servers can be, you know, you could go to Amazon Web Servers uh, services or Google Cloud for a lot of your server setup issues. Um, so you don't have to go to the tech staff, but they are there. And at times, you know, they've set out really special resources like um, there was one team, gosh, it was probably four years back, where they needed, um, th they were using a set of technologies that depended on Xcode and they, they um, required uh, Mac specific server setup. So the tech staff went and took some of the Macs that were used for instructional purposes reconfigured them as a server and made it available to the team um, for you know a mac based uh web web platform basically uh, which they could use um uh you know they could they could set things up for your remote access or or what have you so um i think it's more a question of what they can't do and than it is what they can i mean there's a there's a lot they can do um, there's going to be certain types of specialized hardware where if you ask them, they're not going to have it. But, but there's, you know, they, they have GPU cards. So if you need special GPU support, they can probably do that. But um, there's a lot that they can do in terms of configuring hardware software services. Yeah. 
And one more question. So, like, in case if we plan to use any cloud services, right? In that case, should we use our personal uh, email addresses, or should we ask stakeholder to provide us the account, or we can create a general account right. and then share it with the stakeholder so that they can share it? Right. Get that. Yeah. So there's this. Is, this is a sort of uh, this is a very good thing to discuss. Um, but you've left out one option. Okay which is have the department get the resource, okay? And, th and this is a sort of thing the tech staff might consider. So if you said, look, I need an, an AWS account that can support this amount of computation or whatever, um, this has this amount of storage associated with it, um, they might be able to go and configure it for you and thereby spare, you know, cost side implications for the students. It's not to be assumed that students have to do it on their own, their own personal account or worse, gone. Like, like if, if you have needs uh, that have any sort of cost associated with it, you should talk with me and we should talk with the tech staff because as part of their budget, they have to shell out for force support. And they might be able to just say, yeah, I'm sure we'll get a Google Cloud subscription that will allow you that resource and turn it around like that. So. Um, those are the sort of things that we go to dialogue about and, and hopefully come down soon. But the point is to, to think about those now and start exploring them now. So, you know, it's not something where you need it in the next five hours or it's going to be useless because I need one is not going to be able to be turned in, which is sometimes what happens, right? Um, you know, there's, it's a funny thing about deadlines in the world. Um, deadlines, um, as you get closer to deadlines, often we, we think of it as some procrastinating. Sometimes it's a matter of just pushing work closer to a deadline, right? We just leave it till later. We leave it till later. What we don't realize is sometimes if you leave it till later, the work sometimes multiplies because if you leave it too late, the options for how you deal with it often are closed off. You know. Um, this is not an option because the person's not responding. That's not an option because, you know, it's after business hours. This isn't an option because this resource isn't available. And so what you find is sometimes it gets harder and harder to deliver on the work that's procrastinated too much. It's pushed to later and it becomes harder to deliver on it to complete that work because you have to do more and more workarounds for things that aren't available. If you address it early, often there's more flexibility in how you can address it. And you have the luxury of waiting for things that might, make might take time, but are easy to act on. And so I'm not expressing it well, but what I'm trying to say is actually the amount of work can sometimes multiply when you delay it too much. <laughs> because you know, there's no option except the really awkward one or hard one or brutal force one to, to undertake it. If you see what I mean. Yeah. So these are good questions and bear that in mind, addressing these things early, proactively, like you're asking. And remind me your name? Uh, uh, Shanto? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. So that's, uh, these are, you know, great questions and asking them early like this is showing proactive thinking about it. Other questions? Other issues? Yeah. So is how Larissa. Far, yeah. Okay. How formal is the uh, presentation for my uh, yeah. Um. So uh, in general, I would say, look, uh, presentation should be structured enough that you're pretty sure you're not going to just willy-nilly forget some information. Like, um, you don't want it to be like, you know, someone comes in and sort of says, well, I kind of think we're going to do that. Um, but they might easily forget things. They, they, won't, uh, they won't have something on the screen that I can take away and think about afterwards. Um, uh, it's hard to coordinate multiple people if, if they don't see the information that's going to be presented. It's hard to, to sort of share who's going to do what in the presentation. Um, and uh, it's hard for people to critique it like ahead of time to say, oh, this has been forgotten, that's been forgotten, because nothing's listed out, right? And so it's kind of like, well, I'll go in there and talk about the machine configuration. But 
No one can say, oh, you, you know, you forgot about this side of it. You forgot about that side. So you want it structured enough that, you know, it, it, it presents the major issues systematically in a way that you're pretty sure it it's on um, all the major things and multiple people in the team can look at it and, and improve it, you know, ideally before it. Um, and there's some record so that I can look at it and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'm worried about this thing, or it looks like they've covered the bases or whatever. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, really regimented exact times for things. It doesn't have to be um, everyone in the team presents for that initial presentation. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, you have to hit these 10 issues um, that are specified ahead of time. Um, and the truth is, it's, it's hard to do in a course like this because the project that's developed in a phone app, you know, the set of issues for it is, is rather different than for a, a system which is running on Oculus and virtual reality or a system that's kind of, uh, you know, setting up a, a web, web service on, on cloud technologies. It, there's kind of different, different um, issues involved. And so I don't have a sort of, you know, you have to hit these, uh, these five different things or these 10 different things. So um, just, you know, uh, give it some considered thought. I'll tell you uh, for, for ID zero, for each of the IDs, you'll kind of see a brief list of what should be covered, like the types of things that should be covered in the syllabus. And you want to make sure those are, you know, thought about and addressed, um, and you have some judicious comments about them. Um, I don't expect in ID zero, you know, a lot of discussion about, um, you know, about functionality that's that's rolled out. I, I don't even expect a complete specification of requirements or whatever. It's more, these are, these are the positions in our team. This is the project we're working on. These are the, uh, the major resources we, we think we'll like to use and the major technologies that we're planning to use. Um, and probably some significant discussion on, on you know, how you're gonna uh, address those or overcome any challenges. How are you gonna disseminate knowledge within your team? That would be a good thing to talk about too. I don't require that. I don't think it's on the list, but it's a good thing to talk about. You know, how, uh, how would you coordinate about these things to make sure that everyone in your team has the requisite knowledge to address, you know, this, um, use this set of technologies and as an expectation of the requirements. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you met with the stakeholder by that point, either in virtual or in person, um, you know, it's good to let me know. I said, oh, that's great. Um, it's good you're, you're meeting with them. Um, excellent. Um, so, uh, yeah, those are some comments on ID, ID zero. Okay. Um, great question. Other questions? Okay. So, there was a award given to me a couple of years ago. Over the years, I've been honored to receive some various awards and uh, for, in the teaching area. There was an award given a couple of years ago for uh, which, which basically uh, noted that in the department, I was unparalleled in the number of steps I take um, in my classes. And, uh, and I was known for actually running at times um, to make it fall. This room doesn't give a lot of opportunity for that. I can kind of run back and forth a lot here, but you know, I'd have to slay on the walls or something. Um, there's some other faculty who have a very different style. Um, here I don't even have uh, you know too much in the way of, of, of blackboard use, although occasionally make use of it. But there's some other faculty who have very different styles. One of them, for example, will stand uh, one exact position for most of the class. And then to make an enormously important point, you will shift one step to the right. Or something. That's like a momentous thing, you know, like, wow, okay, a point is being made. I have a somewhat different style. Um, we'll, we'll, I, I'm still getting used to this one. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so so let's, let's talk about um, some expectations here. 
we'll have to watch watch the time. But your questions in this class are always the most important things. Okay, so um, testing, 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 testing. Uh, if there's one thing that stands out in students' experience in this class compared to other software engineering classes, it's typically that there's actual serious attention paid to testing. But that's kind of a blunt way of saying it. What, what I mean by that is it's not just serious attention by me. You folks need to take testing seriously because if you don't find things with tests, they will find you in a bad way. Um, and uh, what I'm expecting here is processes and practices that are up to, to deliver on that. Um, so uh, what's expected of you in this area of sort of testing? Um, uh, well, uh, first of all, it's like so basic that sometimes I'm I think it's not even worth saying, but then every year it bites people on at least one team. So testers are not to be given code like five minutes before the final deadline and told, test it, test it. Um, like you, you gotta have a respectful relationship between the developers and the testers. This is an age old issue because developers don't like having problems with their code identified. And testers don't like to be on the scut end of stuff where things are dumped over to them and they're told, you know, you have a short period of time to test it and uh, we hope you don't find any problems. Um, so you got to provide code to testers early and I'll be looking for that. And one of the keys to this is, uh, is something called a code freeze. Anyone know what a code freeze is? What's a code freeze? Yeah. So like uh, oh, sorry, like in particular uh, cycle, yeah. uh, no one will be allowed to like publish a new code. So that like um, the code can be transferred to the testers and then they can evaluate it. Exactly. And and uh, so you described it well with the proviso that it's like you can't add features or new things to this code. You might fix some bugs, you know. So when you talk about a code freeze, sometimes there's a bit of bug fixing afterwards or something like that, or to deal with a compilation problem. But there's no new functionality or features or new components being added to the code. And code freezes are absolutely key for the reasons you've outlined. Um, that it allows kind of a common point of reference for the testing team to be evaluated rather than have it constantly churn which is one of the things that can drive a testing wild, right? They started testing and they said, oh, you gotta restart the test because we have a new version. Oh, we gotta restart the test. Oh, you can't test those things yet because they're not yet implemented, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, another thing I'm looking for is, is uh, designing for testability. Now that's kind of a sloganish way of putting it, but it, it actually points to something really substantive. Um, when you design the system, when you plan out what's going to be there, you got to plan to test it. Um, we, we sometimes just think as developers, you know, about the, you know, just getting out code. Often we think about the sort of optimal path through the code where everything goes right. And we're often not thinking about the testability, but here, you know, there should be test driven development to provide some some uh, tests up front wherever possible. I'm not going to I'm not going to enforce it really, really, really rigorously, but I am looking for you a lot of the time to put in place tests before the cut. And you should put in place some sort of specifications where possible that says, like, what does this code do? Uh, even if, you know, it hasn't yet been written. Um, there's a big difference between that and how it does it. Specifications basically say what to expect, what you can guarantee, precondition, post-condition, most, most notably with, with function. Um, you have invariance and history properties with classes. Um, test hooks basically are ways to, to design the system to be tested easily. And there's a, the, the term of art here is testability. You want to foster testability in code. 
the ability for that code to be tested. If the code is in a big hairball, it's all on just mass of, of code together. It's going to be really hard to test it. You can't test this little piece or that little piece of it or that little piece. You got to test the whole thing. And it's going to be a nightmare to reach certain parts of it. And it's going to be a nightmare to figure out what's going wrong. Instead, you want to provide a way of carving up the code amongst other things into sort of modules, each of which has an interface associated with it that can be tested separately from the others. And when they depend on one another, which they typically will, you use mocking, for example, to test this um, without also at the same time testing this. Okay, so um, testability is something we foster, and it's something we can foster in a lot of different ways. One of the ways modular. Another way is, is through the use of scripting based interfaces, uh, having, having interfaces that can be called programmatically, not just through a UI, for example. Um, another way is through logging. What does logging help testability? Anyone? Why do I say it helps it be more testable? Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, there is. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, it allows you to uh, sort of provide status updates on what's happening with the code and yep. the expected results of what's occurring. That's right. So it provides uh, sort of a trace of, of what's going on in the code in response to the test, and therefore provides all sorts of test documentation. If the test was successful, it gives you confidence it actually did all the required things. If the test wasn't successful, it helps you understand where it might have bombed out or had problems, how far it gone, which can allow us to, to focus in on the parts that failed, that, that weren't reached. Um, there's, uh, there's ways in which assertions foundationally help testability, because you're checking all these assumptions along the way, and if the assumptions are off, you'll find it as soon as possible. I emphasized that before. Um, Okay, test driven development, put in place the test before the code, you know, um, put in place the test, the code should not work, write your code, the test should work, it should be passed, and then often you go and you refactor the code so it's, it's cleaner and better. Um, developers should be developing unit testing, um, and against the specifications there, when I say against, I mean in accordance with the specifications, typically. The preconditions are tested in, in unit tests, et cetera, or, or the post conditions given the precondition. And mocking is a key technology for whatever platform you use for testing or for, for your system. There should be some attempt to make use of mocking, um, whether it's in JMock or JS mock or Synon or what have you. There's different uh, platforms for different, um, or there's different solutions for different problems. Um, test matrices, these are required. Give me test matrices, please, please. So a test matrix basically says, hey, well, for different tests, that's the columns, tell me what features or requirements they test. Okay, so you got it. The table. Running this way are tests. So this might be test case one, right? Uh, test case two, test case three, etc. And then along here are the features that they are testing. What is this test case testing? It's presumably testing some feature or functionality. It has some job in life that it's doing. And these are the features over here. So uh, these features or functionality or elements of the system. Um, and so this might be feature one, feature two, et cetera. Generally, you know, they don't names. And like test case two might be testing two of these. Test case three might just be testing this one. Why would you create a, a matrix like this? What thing might you be looking for in the matrix? Yeah, the reason. Make sure that every feature is covered. Yeah, make sure every feature is covered. That's a key thing. This is a big concern. This one here, because 
Why is it a big concern? Why do I say it's a big concern? Because there's no test that's checking this feature. And either you've forgotten a check mark here, or you don't have a test to test it. And in this place, in this class, often there's not a test to test it yet. And so you've forgotten to, to test that feature. The other thing you might look for is something like column four here. I should be my stand remiss. Um, my walk remiss. Um, test case four here is also a concern. Why is it a concern? Not clear what it's testing. Like, what's its job? Yeah, what's the point of it? Um, why could this come about? That, that may seem weird. Like, oh, come on. No one's going to create that. Well, maybe once upon a time it had we were checking some things. But what could have happened? Yeah. Uh, feature, uh, features get removed. Features get changed. Why did they get removed? Well, you want to do different incremental deliverables. This is a transitional feature that will be needed for the future. Um, or maybe needs change on the part of stakeholders, right? Um, you, you deprecate something. Um, uh, test cases that were sensible earlier may no longer be sensible. And you should be looking for that. This is an element of what's called traceability. Um, uh, your, your documenting traceability, uh, or it's an element of traceability here. You're finding out basically this test case, it sort of depends on or, or relates to these features. That the traceability is all about sort of the, the relationships between things, between like test cases and the features they test. And the features come out of requirements. So if requirements change, the features might change, which might change what test cases are needed or retained, et cetera. So like rather than think about those things as independent features, tests, requirements, they're all linked. Right? They're all linked logically, and traceability helps those relationships. Hmm. Um, okay, yeah, Risa. Um, just so, like, for this test matrix, will can we be updating it throughout, or is it Oh, I'd be looking for them uh, with each deliverable, like you'd give me the latest version of the test matrix. I mean, typically, there's not an overwhelming number of them. There's, yeah. Two, one for the UI tests, the tests that go through the UI. When I say like through the UI, what I mean is like to, to perform the tests, we have to, it has to go, it has to like pretend to be a person going through the UI. Or maybe there's maybe there's one for the UI automated tests. Maybe there's another one for the UI manual test. Who does that? Who does the manual UI test? Uh, you do. Yeah, so users, and, and uh, typically it's the test team. Well, I'm gonna click on it and stuff like that. Um, something like Oculus that's actually more needed. It's, it's actually harder to test Oculus like in a purely programmatic way through the UI. What are you gonna do with it? You know, like turn the head in a programmatic way. I mean, you can, I, I, I'm, I'm laughing a little bit, but it, it's actually somewhat hard to do. Um, but doing it through, uh, you know, in a manual way, you can do it. It's it's just fairly labor intensive, right? They're like, oh, it's due tomorrow. The the deliverables. We've got to get all the testers up in Sphinx three eighty six using the Oculus at midnight. Yeah, yeah, you get the idea. Um, it's it's not great. Um, or and then maybe you have one matrix for programmatic tests, tests that. That work through test harnesses. If I say test harness, you both sense what I mean by that. What I mean is it's sort of a you're gonna test the system through some code that kind of calls off to it. It's kind of like making the same calls the UI might make, but it's making it from scripted code. From like code that you run as a test code. Yeah, so those might be three different matrices for you. And so, yeah, I'd expect to see those over time. Any other questions about this? Some of these issues of testability and, and 
Yes, no one's. Okay. Um, so I do expect both automated and manual testing. I will be an unhappy camper if there's one or both of those are missing. Both of those are missing. I'll be, you know, I'll be very unhappy. Um, um, okay. Um, so system tests. Um, uh, you need to have system tests. What can I say? You, you need to have a test. It's like testing use. You need to have many tests that are testing use cases and to end experiences the user might have with with various actions that involve feature use. Uh, uh, it's not just testing one feature at a time. It's testing sequences of actions that a user might perform within the system. You need those um, coverage testing. I I want as well. So what do I mean by coverage testing? Anyone? Anyone? What do I mean by coverage test? Yeah. You should be look to Would we? Yes. Oh. You should be look to make sure that um, each line is always been covered by test. Yeah, exactly. It it can be lines. Generally, lines are how it's most commonly forgive my English, how it's most commonly thought of. Um lines are what we consider most commonly, but we can also do it with like um have you hit functions or whatever. But yeah, let's say lines. Lines are good. Um, uh, you can say parts of conditions, but but yeah, so so lines of code. So you're trying to get, you're trying to exercise your system to exercise all the lines of code of it. Now let me ask this: If you hit, if your tests at a given deliverable have hit all the lines of code, hundred percent code coverage, you say. Success, 100% code coverage. We've achieved that. Does that mean your system is bug free? No. Because maybe, maybe you reached all those. Maybe they all worked swimmingly. They were all worked great. But if you had had different data, maybe it would have cracked, right? If you had a zero somewhere, it would crash. Someone once told me the Roman Empire crashed because, because of those pointers. So. <laughs> that was not true. Um, uh, um, but uh, but the fact is, like like you can reach the same line of code where it's great with certain data, and then with the wrong type of data, it you know it, it crashes. So code coverage doesn't like hundred percent code coverage doesn't guarantee being bug free, but it's hard to claim you. That you're bug free without having really good code code. Right? Like, like you can't say this is highest quality software. You haven't even reached half of it, right? In your, in your like tests. Like, how do you know you how do you have any confidence about it? You know, if you haven't reached in testing at least once, right? Um, so that's the spirit of it. Um, testing is always a matter of risk management. We, we never have time to do exhaustive testing of any realistic system. But what we can do is, um, is uh, you know, strive to eliminate major risks, uh, develop confidence the system is working well, and plug obvious holes in our in our testing, things to which we're obviously vulnerable because we've never even looked at them. Um, and and really, that's a lot of what I'm asking you for this year, um, or in in three seventy one issue tracking is another thing. I I don't know if I have to comment on that these days, but. But you know, you should when a defect or a system trouble incident is identified, um, you should be you should be tracking it. You, you shouldn't just you know leave it to a whisper to a developer to deal with. There should be some recording because that developer to whom you whisper it and sotto voce, you know, may forget it tomorrow, or maybe they may be sick, or or you know it slips their mind or what have you uh, and so you need to spread it around to the test team it shouldn't, or to the development team it shouldn't just be in the head of that developer so you need a an issue tracking system that will track these things and let you know for example if it's in an issue tracking system is it a duplicate of another one is it for an outdated version of the system is it still relevant it was entered there two months ago is that still germane um, to the system. Uh, issue tracking can allow you to mark severity of it, like uh, document 
how serious a bug is if it occurs. It can also allow you to document priority event, which takes into account not only how serious it is, but its likelihood of occurrence. It's kind of risk exposure was the term I used last term for. So issue tracking is something that you, you really want to invest in to, um, to make sure that people are aware of this issue, um, are thoughtfully thinking about it, uh, can identify duplicates, etc. So you want to take into account issue tracking. And, you know, it's not necessarily a defect. What other issues might there be besides a bug, a logical bug? What other issues might there be um, that you would put in an issue tracking system? Remember, someone said it two times ago. There were some issues that would really bother you as a user. It would really, really be a problem, even if they're not logical bugs. Yeah. 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 Performance issues. Can, it, can, it can be really distressing, right? And delays lead to user input problems. It's one of the lessons, yeah. It goes back for me. 30 years, um, more than 30 years. Um, and, uh, and the fact is, if you have long delays, people do weird things. But that sounds strange. I'm, I'm not talking, you know, to get up and dance or something. I'm, I'm just saying that they like start pressing buttons multiple times. Like, oh, it's not paying attention, you know. Let me press it again. Press. And <laughs> like weird things happen in our systems when you press sometimes multiple times so you submit the form multiple times you get you know it debited from your account multiple times. Well, hopefully that doesn't happen um but the point is uh when latency is too long what's another one yeah yeah security issues huge mission critical excellent your name again sid, sid. um mission critical issue um, can mean the success or failure of the system, success or failure of uh, people in, in using it long term sustainability. So that's a great example. What's another one? Responsiveness uh, and bug issues. Yeah, exactly. And so user experience in general is is one of the the key the key issues, right? If it's hideously ugly, or if it's hard to understand, or if it's confusing. Um, if it's um, if it's really uh, sort of uh, cryptic and, and how it's presented, that that's a real issue to be an issue tracking. The final thing I'll say is you should have some sort of cra uh, crash reporting in place, like you use with crash lists, or there's there's a bunch of ones that basically will will ensure that you know if you have a if you have a defect that that crashes something on your phone in your phone app. It will report it automatically back to the mothership. It will report it to a to an issue tracking database where you'll know about it. If it's a user who experienced the problem on their phone, they might not otherwise go and click, but this will take care of automatically reporting. Um, so something to think about. So I'm, I'm looking for you to adhere to a, a V model for testing here. Which involves, um, you know, uh, requirements being tested by acceptance tests, um, architecture and use cases by set, uh, by this is rough, but system tests, high level design by integration tests, and low level design by unit tests. Okay, so um, this is, and, and I haven't shown a regression test. Anyone knows what a regression test is? Two two ways one uses you to Regression well, regression tests involve a system regressing, meaning it. Um, if something was working, no, it's not. These are some of the most important types of testing to be done. Um, I tell you, if you give a if you give a new version of a system to someone. There's a new feature in there and it doesn't work. They'll be unhappy. They'll be disappointed. Right? They were hoping to use this new feature and it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you haven't delivered a great deal of new value with this version of the system. They'll be a lot more unhappy if you do what? 
you break a feature that used to be working because their workflow depends on it. They need that. They built it into their documents. They built it into their day, you know day to day work. And, and if you can't do that anymore, there'll be a lot less happy. So when a system regresses, like something that was working before no longer works, that's a really that's a really like a one bad thing with a capital B. Now that's not the only type of regression. That's one use of the term. The other is, and it's related. If there was a defect that was in there before, it reemerges. It's like a zombie. It comes back. I know you both some of the numbers, but I'm not going to. Uh, it comes back, um, and uh, and when that happens, um, it's also very problematic because it's something you thought you fixed. And now it's re resurfaces. It's resurfaced. Um, why might that happen? Like, I argued the first of them, uh, this issue of a feature that used to work stopping working. That's really bad for the user. It's high severity. It's like really, really problematic. You delivered negative out, right? You've broken something that used to work. And, and it's 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 really strong negative value. So it's really bad, high severity in the sense that it's it's really bad for the user. This other one, bugs re-emerging, defects re-emerging, it's really high probability. Why, why do I say it's high probability? What what would make a bug re-emerge? Anyone? Give me a reason a, a, a defect might re-emerge after we declare it dead. Why might it re-emerge? Yeah, okay, so maybe maybe we were too glib and saying fixed, resolved, done. It's 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 you know and, and maybe that wasn't maybe maybe it was just a test, maybe it was just the developer who reported it and no tester has tested it yet. Or the user that saw it originally hasn't tested it. So one of the reasons that testing you should validate when developers claim things are are fixed because sometimes the developer doesn't really understand it and they think it's so yeah yeah that, that was fixed but they didn't really understand what it was reason you have something uh maybe the person developer post uh old precisely so someone else had fixed it and pushed it out but the developer another developer later who didn't do a poll of that fix, check some other code in that has the old code. And it, lo and behold, it has the bug that was fixed. Um, it, it has this bug. It's, so it's very quite likely that we'll, we'll come up. Okay, um, uh, we're running out of time. A couple more things. Debug, okay, principle for one. Okay, this is a, a life lesson. Um, when something goes wrong, Obviously, you want to fix what's going wrong, but you want to ask what left yourself vulnerable to that, and why? And could you next time have detected it sooner? So there's two questions, right? Like one is like why did this come up in the first place? And when I say that, I mean looking beyond the obvious. Um, put up in the first place, but go on and introduce the bug. Uh, no, you, you, you want to look beyond that. Like maybe, maybe John introduced the bug because he hadn't had a full understanding of how React Native worked, and so he he made this mistake based on a mistaken understanding of how Jest works in React Native or whatever. Um, uh, there are certain things that will lead you to be vulnerable, and then there are certain things that will that will mean. It took unnecessarily long to discover it. And both those things are of, of concern. Um, so you should be debugging a process, like uh, your software development process. When you discover a, a thing, it's like, how can we how can we put into place tests that would find those sort of defects faster next time? What tests, you know, the fact that we only found this now, what tests could we add to our test cases to, to make it Catch those things earlier. Um, those are those are some important things. Bug charts we talked about. Build for testability. Uh, automate most tests. When tests start manual, you should be thinking: Can we automate them? 
check the errors coming out of tests. Like, don't assume because the test ran and didn't crash that it ran successfully. You want to check, like, did it in fact work? You know, like, did it get the right response from the system? Um, uh, so you should consider the risk of task, uh, consider containerization. Well, we may talk more about that. Um, you should think about, just like you do pair programming, you should think about pair testing and buddy testing and um, require as part of builds test, test runs to perform. Um, potentially coverage, potentially regression tests, definitely unit tests and some system tests. Um, and you're going to want to make sure requirements changes are known across your your team. And make sure there's good communication between the uh, the test and the dev. Okay, um, I think that's all we'll talk about uh, right now. Um, we'll finish this up, and I want to talk about peer reviews next time. Quickly about inspections that are required, and some other types of peer reviews like peer programming, peer dev checks, walkthroughs, etc. Okay, um, so that's uh, all for now. Remember, the tutorial room is yours. You can meet with your teams. I'm also going to be in my office if anyone wants to meet with me. Okay, thank you.